Good afternoon and welcome to Live with Dawn Butler. Today we're going to be discussing a very sensitive subject, um, a very important subject, and a subject that's not often discussed in the front rooms of many households, but we're bringing you the topic today. It's a topic of FGM, female genital mutilation, and I've got two very special guests with me in the studio. From forward, I've got Nana Otu Oriate. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon to you. Hello. And I've got from Daughters of Eve, Leila Hussein. Good afternoon to you. I want to start with um, <coughs> Leila because Leila, you've actually had the practice done to you, uh, FGM. Tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Um, for me, like many other girls, I think I was that girl. Actually, I think my difference, my story has always been quite different to a couple of my friends. Mm -hmm. I was the girl who didn't know what FGM was. Mm -hmm. I, I was a, a child who was raised in Saudi Arabia, so I wasn't I wasn't aware of the practice. And then obviously my parents decided to move back to Somalia and if you want to go to school, this, this had to happen. So I was that girl who actually didn't know. If you want to go to school, this has to happen? Well, because if you don't have it done, you're stigmatised by your community, by your peers. I actually remember when it happened to me, my sister, uh, on my face though, for the first day of school, I remember a couple of girls run up to me and they said, have you had good name done? That's what we call it, good name. And, and I remember saying, yes, yes, I did have it. And I remember she pointed to the girls, oh, we can play with her now. Wow. So it's really, it's something that's ingrained into our psyche. You know, it's, and at the time, you know, you don't think anything bad of it because you're, you belong to this society. Everybody's gone through it. It's normal. It's part of life. Yes, it was very, very painful. But that's kind of, no one ever talks about it. There's a lot of secrecy when it comes to this subject. No one talks about it ever again. And this is why on Star Media we've decided that we have to bring this subject mm -hmm. into the front room, especially in the UK because, can I call you Auntie Nana? Yes, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's <all good. laughs> Are you call Auntie Nana? So Auntie Nana, it's a, it's, is it a growing epidemic in the UK? Because the figures range from 6,500 to 23,000 young people in the UK who are at risk of having this uh, female genital mutilation done to them. I think the issue of numbers is actually very difficult and I will always say that the numbers that we have more or less like guesstimates because mm. the reality is that they wouldn't count numbers, they right. wouldn't really um, go home house to house to go and ask have you had your daughter done, is she going to be done and if they are going to even ask you are you going to have your daughter done, of course you would say you're not going to have your daughter done. Mm. So the numbers that are used are based on statistics so they would look at evidence of mothers who have had it done in countries of origin and then maybe look at the prevalence so for example if in a case like uh, Somalia where you have maybe about 98 percent then they would look at okay if you've got a daughter how, how likely is it that she would have FGM done so those are the ways in which they use to calculate the numbers a lot of the numbers are also based on the prevalence study that was done and the census in um, 2001. So the figures really, what we got from the figures, uh, because that was a research that was organized by Forward, it said that 24,000 girls were at risk of the most severe type of FGM, which is FGM type 3. And really, that was at that time, which was 2007. Mm -hmm. And it was not a yearly thing. So again, people tend to use numbers that yearly, but those numbers, is mm. really, we really need to take numbers with a pinch of salt. And you, talk, you touched on the different types, and there's actually four, there's four types, yeah. different types. Now, I was quite surprised when I read that there were four different types. Mm. I was quite, I mean, it's very severe. I mean, you know, you watch, you can get anything now when you Google it on YouTube, mm. and, it, and it's actually really severe. And you said, I mean, you, you quite brushed past, yes, it was painful, but, and you kind of just, you know, brushed it past. Is that because you've dealt with it now? You've I mean, I didn't, I, I mean, 
I think I've talked about it so many times, it's just become something that's become quite normal to me. But, I just, but for me, um, you're right, there, 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 there is, I think people forget the severity of FG and because you can't tell uh, a girl's gone through FG by the way she walks, you can't see the scar, it's mm. hidden. And I think that's why till now, it's, mm. that's why nobody talks about it because if you had a scar on your face, people will be sympathetic to you, mm -hmm. they'll engage with you, but because yeah. it's hidden, it's it's difficult to bring it to the forefront, mm. and for me, I mean, th I mean, it's the different types, you know, there's type one, which is you know the pricking of the clitoris, type two, you cut the clitoris and then you close the top part of the small labias, type three, which is also referred to as the infibulation types, where they remove literally everything, the labias are removed, mm. the large ones and the small uh, and the minor one, and the clitoris, and then they pull the skin together, and s it actually sewn from top to the bottom to a point where they leave a little hole, not even a matchstick can get through. Gosh. So you're expected to urinate, menstruate, you know, if you get married, intercourse, have a baby at some point. Mm. So it's, you See, can't that's yeah, That really just yeah. really turns my stomach and mm. makes me feel quite angry and emotional just hearing that somebody would do that to a child from newborn to mm. teenage years. You just think, why would somebody do that? Um, and and to think that it's it's common practice. It's not actually. There's nothing in any of the religious religious doctrines that says you should do this. Not in the Quran, in the Bible, mm -hmm. anything like but that. But I think the issue about um, that's what Leila was saying that it, it really is normal at seen in the community. Yeah. And this is where we need to realize that FGM is seen as a social requirement. Absolutely. You are yeah. born in that community. And in 2013, it's still seen as a now, social requirement? It's a social requirement because it's a way, like Leila was saying, when she went to school, now we can play with her. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that now we can play with you, but it's now you can get married. Now you are yeah. accepted to, to speak with us. Now you are accepted yeah. to be accepted in my family. I was talking to a Sierra Leonean family, and it was quite interesting. The guy said, growing up, I dare not have a girlfriend who hadn't been yeah, I heard you know. that there's some men who refuse to yes. marry a woman unless she's had it done. Yeah. Well, really, the, 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 the concept of it really comes down to that because a lot of mothers, when you say to them, when you say to them, why did you do this? It's the same answer. Who is going to marry my daughter? Mm. Wow. Who is going? And so it's, so the conversation, yes, we need to, uh, uh, it can't, obviously can't be hidden anymore, but I think men have to be part of this campaign. Because at the end of the day, it's done for them. <laughs> it's but really do, but interesting. Do, but do <laughs> they? Yeah, but do it's they? Really because they, they, they also say because it enhances the men's sexual pleasure. So that's what, so they wow. insist sometimes that they have it done. Like when a woman has a given birth, to be honest, they insist that they, yeah. she's sewn back up. It's a lot of men. And that a lot of, oh, a, in the, the pressure. The pressure is from the men to have yeah. the women to be sewn back up. But what we're also seeing is that there's actually been very interesting research where. Now, in the UK, you find that, unlike Africa, where men didn't used to come to the maternity wards, mm. and no man, I mean, I remember I had two children in Africa, and my husband wouldn't dare mm -hmm. come anywhere in the maternity mm. ward. Whereas in the UK, you have no choice but to have your presence there whilst yeah. your wife is having a baby. So men are now seeing the challenges, the problems, the difficulties that women are having. And the research that is quite interesting, actually some men are saying that, no way, my daughter is not going to go through oh, that. Okay, because I'm, I'm now seeing it. Right, you know? so you're actually seeing that you, men yes. are so, but, but you're telling me that you have to physically bring the man to the maternity <laughs> for him to watch the pain <laughs> sorry, that his sorry. wife's going but through before he comes to realize that this is a bad thing. But sadly, there are still some men who actually see her go through that and also ask that she should need to be stitched mm. back up. I, I yeah. remember yeah. a particular case because I used to do the pre counseling for the reverse operations. Right. And I remember one woman, you know, she just had so many infections and after an infect to a point where the GP refused to give up any more antibiotics because there's mm. a limit you can have in a year. And I remember saying to her, you know, you need to go and have this done. And she goes, I need to go talk to my husband. I said, that's fine, you know, go whatever you need to do. Mm. My husband came and he goes, there's no way my, w my wife's going to be opened right. by anyone. Actually, he at the time said to me, when she had her two babies in Africa, he paid for her to be sewn back again. 
So it was, there's, when you talk about the control, there's something uh, controlling about FGM, you know, it's mm -hmm. to control women. But all forms of domestic violence, female violence, boils down to control. It doesn't boil down to anything else but yeah. control. They, they like, you know, <coughs> they like to control. But the um, issue about the control element is mm -hmm. that the control also comes with some elements of sanctions. Mm -hmm. That's why it's actually more powerful. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have it done, the, the man is going to leave you. If you don't have it done, you won't get married. Now, for a lot of us who come from African communities, marriage is the. You're not married. When are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? I mean, recently, my son. Well, you get that in all communities. I, yeah, you course. get that in the UK. Yeah. Are you not getting yeah. married? Yeah. But I mean, UK, I mean, we have a situation <laughs> where people <laughs> live together and don't necessarily get married. Mm -hmm. But we're finding that in our communities, it's not just me and you, it's the families of the two. So mm -hmm. the woman, the mother in law, is insisting she's coming to my house, who is she clean? Mm -hmm. So we really are can't asking you just say, these you, questions. Can't you just say yes? Well, can't you just pretend? <laughs> can't you just pretend <laughs> that you've had well, it this done? Is, this is the thing. The, the reason FGM is practicing is for chastity, so apparently girls will remain virgin. That mm -hmm. is not true. Mm -hmm. The other one is it's clean and it's beautiful. It's not clean because no. everything sits there. And that's, yeah. so many and that's why you have reproductive a lot of problems and lots of women becoming fertile. Yeah, infertility one of grows. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of contradicts. I always find it really interesting when I talk to a lot of you know the elderly, and I said it's really strange that we are a community. Especially, I'm from Somalia, so I think it's very important to have children, family is very important. Mm -hmm. But the women have been put in a position where they can't even give birth. Mm -hmm. So how can we? want children mm -hmm. but make it so difficult yeah well maybe that's a point that we don't we don't project that we don't say look you want mm -hmm. it's the reverse of if you actually want your daughter to have children then do not get this done but do not have this procedure this done. is where the prevention work comes in because a lot of women will never associate their issues that they're having with fgm yeah you always find that right. and i was one of those women mm -hmm. so I, it's don't assume just because they're not educated or they don't speak the language. Mm. It's that association, you just don't associate anything bad. I Did you not you associate know. it because you, in a way, compartmentalised it, you put it to a side, you, 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 you dealt with it and you then you moved it. on. That's the right word for it, you yeah? suppress it somewhere. So that's why you didn't link any other no, problems to and, that. And you will find, I, I, again, you know, being from a small community, I always hear my aunties and all the other women going, oh, I've got lower back pain, I've got lower abdominal pain. Yeah. That's very common with women who've Who had FGM, yeah. and especially the fibrillation because of they having urine, uh, urine infections. So yeah. But nobody would say the reason I'm having it's a lot of urine infections of, is mm. because of FGM. Mm. It's okay, so we're going to talk about, we're going to go to a break mm -hmm. and then we're going to mm -hmm. talk, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the legal ramifications oh of mm -hmm. FGM uh, in the UK <laughs> and <laughs> what's been done, what could be done and what should be done and what we should be saying to That's the government, good. the improvements. It's important. Great. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. You're welcome back to Live with Dawn Butler. As I say, I'm joined uh, by Auntie Nana and Layla, and we're talking about the important subject of FGM. Now, Nana, Auntie Nana. Yes, dear. Do we really have the right to tell people in countries like Egypt, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, Nigeria, Kenya, Togo, Senegal, Yemen, Iraq, how to live their lives? The reality is that we're in a human rights era. A lot of our countries have signed human rights documents saying that we are all entitled to make decisions in our lives. We all have a right to our bodily integrity. We all have a right to, I mean, before education, you know, health, all these related issues, we all should enjoy them. And because some of these um, practices, particularly, female genital mutilation really impacts on women in a very, very severe way. We're actually now realizing that. It's not only people telling us. We're finding that people themselves are questioning, mm -hmm. you know. So what is important is that if we've done but, this for ages... But are they questioning? Because in Egypt, for example, the parliamentarians, or some female parliamentarians, are trying to reverse the law to say that it's illegal, but let's make it legal because it's for it's done for cosmetic purposes to make um, to make your vagina look pretty but the reality is that who are these people who are talking for who that the reality mm. is that we've seen a lot of ordinary women 
who are getting up to say that, you know what, enough is enough. We are tired of having to go through this issue of female genital mutilation. We are no longer having our children to go through. So it's happening in parts of Africa. It's happening in so many countries in Africa. And you'll find that even in communities like Somalia, right now, we're finding women who tell you that, you know what, my mom didn't take me through, you know. I recently was at the GP. I was talking to this lady. My mom didn't take me through because my mom made a decision. So we are finding that individual women are making the decisions. I'm not telling you. I'm not telling her. But I'm keeping it secret. Yeah. And because yeah. I'm keeping it secret, I don't want you to know. So really, it's a movement that's going on quietly. And you're finding yeah. that it's happening. A lot of girls are telling you, I didn't go through it. Yeah. But okay. then it's like uh, okay. coming out. It's like a coming out. Situation. Yes. Oh, yeah, you know, I haven't had it done. And they wait for that reaction mm -hmm. because you've been, you, you, are, you will be stigmatized. I'm a person, I have a 10 year old daughter, and I know she's going to be stigmatized because. And I'm your very daughter public. lives here in the UK, and you're telling me that your daughter's going to be stigmatized? Absolutely. Yep, I'm sure. Well, I, in I, the community? I, when I started telling people about my story, because I never had type 3 done. Mm. And because I didn't have type three done, three done, I got stigmatized because mm. I it would, people say, "Oh, you don't know, you don't know, you you don't know what it's like to have type three, so you can't really." Talk but about that it. is true. You don't know what it's like to have type three done. That that's actually very true. But for me, it's never been about which types. The moment you grab a child and you pin them to a table, you vi violated them yeah. from that moment. Yeah. Technically, I, mean, I haven't had FGM done, mm. but my reality is that because I was born in Southern Ghana. My friends in northern Ghana had, had FGM done. I could have been born anywhere. I could have been born in Somalia. Actually, people see my daughter as Somalian. They think she's Somalian. So the issue is that if I was born, could I have prevented it? So the issue is not whether you've had it done or how you feel about it. It's a human rights right. violation. Right. And we need to raise our voices around human rights violations wherever we are. Or, you know, we have a voice. Maybe we need to use our voice. Use that voice in a very positive way that would protect. Saving one girl is just as good for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, to, to, I mean, if you say, I always say, you save one girl, you save, you save a whole generation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And it's important that women really come out and voice mm -hmm. that affects the FGM is having on them. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's still very, very secret. And, and there is this. And with any type of abuse, there's always shame attached to it. Mm. So I think when someone's but carrying particularly shame, because it happens it. there, yeah. the, the, the issue around shame and, and taboos around mm. talking about sexual matters, yeah. bringing issues but around that in the domain. What I it's don't understand about because you there is a lot of shame associated with any form of Absolutely. sexual abuse. Mm. But what I don't understand is how you can allow a man to do this to a young girl. I mean, you know, you wouldn't expose your naked daughter to a man at any other time, surely. Again, this is the contradiction that happens. You know, you've been brought up not to show anyone to your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that day, yeah, you're the free, whole, you're you're free to show to everyone. A whole room full of yes. people yes. are watching you. You're I mean, most intimate. My, my, uh, I'm a psychotherapist, so I specifically work with women who've gone through FGM. And actually, a lot of them were upset more. Instead of, they weren't really upset about the cutting. They were more upset about being exposed like that. Yeah. Mm. in front of men. Mm. I mean, it could be anywhere, but for them, because they said, you know, they were brought up not to expose their bodies to, not to anyone, and then it was in public domain. But how can you have such a contradiction? Mm. I mean, no. well, people say that it's in the, it's in the, um, it's in the Quran. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That, I, that I, is a very, very tricky issue because mm. it's not. It's mm. not. And actually, yeah. what, actually, mm. um, come, if I come back to the Somali community, one of the reasons Somali communities have been at the forefront in saying no to FGM at the moment, for the last couple of years, it has something to do with meeting other Muslims, like the Pakistanis and the mm. Indians who are Muslim, who never heard of this before. And that really helped them question, wait a minute. And I specifically remember when I was going to a mosque in this country, and the teacher was talking about male circumcision. I remember my sister shouted out, oh, I remember when we had ours done. And I remember the teacher saying, what are you talking about? Mm. Because it was, an, and it's not in the Quran, it's not in the Bible, it's not in the Torah, because the Ethiopian Jews also practice, and it's practiced by non-believers. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. we need to recognize it as it's violence against women and girls. But for me, and one of the things that we are also seeing is that now, I mean, 10 years ago when we used to work in this area, there was even the names that being used. Now we are calling FGM Sunnah. 
Now, yeah, when know. somebody is calling FGM Sunnah, oh, you've God. given it a label. Yeah. Absolutely. You've given it as an obligation. You've given it as you should do it. Yeah. And because of that, that is really changing the dynamics. Mm. And you ask some religious leaders, and they're very silent about this. So, oh, it's, it's one of the hadiths, which is the sayings mm. of the prophet. So it's like, Wow, is it so? So we are actually so finding a lot out, of where is it? They had to show no, us yeah. where he no, says no, 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 because yeah. it's all it's yeah. all um, around your body is a temple that yeah. you you cannot yeah. you, you you know you shouldn't defame what God uh, has yeah, made yeah, yeah, you know yeah, it's yeah, made yeah, in God's yeah, image yeah, yeah. etc. Yeah. Well, for me, it's always been oh, um, if we decided to cut children's hands tomorrow for the sake of culture, would we be having this conversation? Mm. Really, because you're saying it's okay to cut that part of her body, mm -hmm. but would God accept me if I? Cutting yeah. But again, some people will say, well, it's down to their culture, and if it's not religious based, and most lots of religions uh, are exacerbated by a culture, so maybe they're saying, well, it's part of their culture, and this, what is, is, what is, culture? And this is what they do. What is culture, and who makes culture? Mm -hmm. If you look at people... Mainly men. I mean, the reality mm -hmm. is that you look back 10 years ago, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, people have shifted, even the way they dress. I remember a young woman, a lady we were talking to in, in Soma, in, from Somalia. She said, Nana, 10, 15 years ago, we weren't dressing like this. Now we're dressing like this. Mm -hmm. Culture is very, very As in, they were freer, freer, they, were freer, they yes, dressed yes, more freely yes, before, yes, and now... Uh, yes. so, what we so have culture is very is. much, how do you put... You know, yeah. label on something that somebody is. You know, culture has to do with the way we eat, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we sing, the way we dance. Yeah. You know, culture has to do with everything. It's almost like trending. You know, like the Twitter when you have a trend and all of a sudden it comes out, everybody's trending, and that's a new culture. A new so culture. we need to trend. I don't trick the tweet. FTM. Is <laughs> <laughs> you don't tweet under no. that. <laughs> so we need to. So we need to start some yes. kind of. Revolution. Revolution. Yes. As you said, there's a yeah. movement. You said there's yes. a movement going. We need yeah. to get that. It's a slow movement. So it is happening. Slow is that because of happening. is that because of the law? The law changed in uh, 1985. There was a law that made FGM illegal, and then 2003, that law was improved. That if you take a child out of the country, that's still illegal. Is it the law that started the change, or did the change happen before the law? I mean, I, I would say that the law really is part of the process. But the law does not necessarily change people's hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. People continue to steal, even though it's against the law to steal. Mm -hmm. uh, people continue to commit crimes, even though Absolutely. it's against the law to, you know. So you'll find that these practices like female genital mutilation, really, they are social norms. And because the sanctions from the communities are much stronger, we actually need to ensure that we change hearts and minds of communities, mm. such that those who are at the forefront. Now, you said men are the forefront. You find that a lot of the times it's the women who are the mm, forefront. The, the mother is organizing mm. it. The grandmother is organizing it. The sisters yeah. are organizing it. Mm. You need to change the hearts and minds of all these people. So you're players. saying that the community sanction Community sanction is way more powerful, it is. important it is. than Both a legal than a legal together. sanction. Yeah, because there's no point of having policies and laws if it's not been implemented properly. That's like what we have in the UK. We have yep. great multi agency work. We have mm -hmm. the bill. We got these passports. Mm. Because how many, this, how, this many agenda, this how many, how many people? I mean, <laughs> yes. Yeah, show the passport to the camera. This is the passport. This is the yeah. FGM but passport. <laughs> so tell us a little bit. So before we move on, so this is the passport, and the the aim of this is that it's been given out in some schools. It has not been rolled out in schools, but the idea is that it should be. Yeah, I know some schools in Bren, it has been given okay. to some of the young yeah. people, and they're supposed to carry it with them. No, the problem when the is, trouble. is uh -huh. great, but it's not mandatory. I've had head teachers say to me. I don't when you come into my school talking about FGM because you will upset my staff members. Yeah. Mm. This is the problem. But lots of schools don't want um, you coming in and talking about any time, type of sexual... But if, it, if yeah. this was implemented into okay. child protection trainings, it's done. It's mandatory. Mm. But it has to, to be mandatory because mm. this yeah. is, again, it's a violation against children. Mm. So you'd like Star Media to have a campaign to make this mandatory. Oh, but do you like... Do you like... You see, do you like this? Let's see. Let's say that... Is this the right information that we want to get? I thought it was a bit wordy myself. It is wordy. And I, I mean, thought you, just, me, you needed one page to say, yeah. if you get, if you cut me, you're going to prison. But maybe I a little think, bit more words I than mean, that. For, for quite a number of people who may not necessarily be that literate, you know, mm. this will not say a lot to them, you no. know. But the reality is that this is a, a document, just like you may, you may have your passport, but you may not necessarily know all that's in your passport. So this is it, really it, for it, you again, to use it for that matter. It's still part of it. Yes, it does help. Mm -hmm. Karen, you know, if you go back home and they've got to listen, 
moment, if I do this, look, I'll be in trouble. Mm. However, would they take any notice of this document from the UK back in Kenya or Somalia that some that you know you're going to hold this up? Would anybody really take you know, any notice? You, you know the interesting thing. This has been piloted in Holland, mm. right? And what was done in Holland is that there was quite a lot of community-based work, mm. and as part of the community-based work, the women in the communities were saying that okay, we now hear that this issue female genital mutilation is really not acceptable. However, mm -hmm. if I go, how can I stop my grandmother? How can I stop my mother? How can I stop my auntie when I go on holiday? So we need something that is signed, mm -hmm. documented with stamps, mm -hmm. you know, to show that this is something that is actually very important but for the English. government. Do they read English? Well, they in, might not I think there are, copies, there are copies in different languages. Okay. Yeah, there well, are different I, languages. I, I yeah. take your point because even if they spoke Somali, some women can't read Somali. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's the teacher who's going to give this to a parent should have enough time to explain what it is without the parent feeling they need to read the whole thing. But they thing. don't give it to the parent, they give it to the children, mm. isn't it? They don't give it to the it's children. See, that's what I'm saying, has to, he's not, we've got all these great documents, but it's not implemented properly. Yeah. If this was in schools, every teacher should know about it, the, your GP should know, your practice knows, should know. every time you have an immunization, you're going away, your practice yeah. should pop this up and say, this is something for because, you. Yeah. Because August and September are the key months when children and Christmas uh, are taken on, on holiday because mm -hmm. if you have stage three done, it takes two weeks to recover from the. Oh, no, from it, takes the more than that. Mm, it takes more than, more than that. So you have at least six weeks during six the holiday. Right. Yeah. So the six weeks, and of course, you're finding that some families may even go on holiday earlier. So they will mm -hmm. choose to go maybe two weeks before the holiday, mm -hmm. some even a month before the holiday. So you have ample time to be healed mm -hmm. before you come back, you know. But the reality is, is that not everybody is having it done back home. There are people who are having it done in the UK. So it's happening here in the UK. You're telling me that FGM is happening here in the UK. Yes. We but you can get up to 14 years in prison and a fine if you're caught um, committing the crime of, mm -hmm. uh, of FGM, of cutting. Mm -hmm. let's, let's call it what it is, cutting. You can, people can get up to 14 years in prison. Why have we not convicted anyone if it's happening here in the UK? I mean, just last year, there was this big Sunday Times mm -hmm. uh, article about doctors, two doctors. One was even a dentist. So it means yeah, that anybody who has instruments can cut. The dentist was the one who was cutting, and yes. the GP was providing the yeah, antibiotics. The antibiotics. The yeah. Wow. yeah. So the reality is that they were definitely supplying. Mm -hmm. And some people were demanding it. So we do know that there is, if there is supply, the demand, there will always be suppliers, you know. Yeah. So there is the fact that it is happening here. I mean, there was, the only case I've heard was a young woman who said she was cut in this country. That was a long time ago. But the reality is that she said, look, she didn't know anything about it. And if there was any okay. information given to her, she could have taken action. There is a law, like you mentioned, there's been a law in place since 1985. 1985. The, the reality is that nobody has been prosecuted. Again, you must remember FGM, you know, it's done because it's good for you. So there is, again, this is, mm -hmm. it's very confusing for a child. So mm -hmm. even in the UK, children are being brought up Absolutely. to believe that oh, yeah. FGM is I good know for many you. Girls. Oh, yeah. And you're telling me that yeah. modern guys yes. are, 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 are Look, we, we've, done a, we've done a training uh, in, in uh, was it in Greenwich? A 16-year-old, no, she was 18 at the time, she said, well, I went home to have it done because I feel it's my oh, right, okay. it's my religious obligation to do it. So after the discussions, and we said, but whoever told you that it was your re religious obligation? So somebody is telling girls that it is a religious obligation. Mm -hmm. You're getting it from the community, you're getting it from the family. Somebody is mentioning it that way. So we have a situation where girls, I mean, recently another girl who said that, well, I also had it done, I chose to do it. Mm -hmm. Because somebody said it's my religious obligation. So we are I read really that, but then I also read uh, one of the girls who chose to do it didn't actually take on board what it entailed. And of when he, she had it done, yes. it, affe it, it, affect, course, it affected her yeah. so dramatically. Yes. And now she ha and now many yeah. young girls have mental health problems. So yes. well, if the parents want their child to grow up, get married and have children, mm -hmm. you're then running again. It's, you're running mm -hmm. the risk of them coming back with mental but health problems. But this is problems. the thing, again, yeah. with FGM, when people talk about FGM, we always talk about the physical yeah. effects, yeah. Mm. but the psychological scar is even worse. Yeah. Yeah. You can reverse that part of your body that was mm -hmm. mutilated and you can urinate like everybody else, mm. but psychologically that scar is still there. Mm -hmm. Many of these women are suffering from uh, depression, mm. postnatal depression has become so very, very common because that fear of having a baby is mm. mm. uh, um, uh, Sexual dysfunction is really, that's 
very common. I think all, every woman I've seen has had that problem. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, again, that's, it's not just affecting you physically, it affects you emotionally, psychologically. Mm -hmm. But again, going back to what you were saying earlier, if you're, the, the problem with FGM is, the, leg, uh, the legality in this country, it puts you in a position where you have to say, so where you have to say, uh, you have to take your parents to court. This you is report, the difficulty yeah. around mm -hmm, it. Because mm -hmm. the only way someone's going to get convicted, that child has to go to court and say, my parents did that to me. Yeah. How the hell do you... Does it have to be your parents? Can it not be the dentist and you see, the, the, the... It's very... It's very the it's UK, very law, the the UK law has never been tested. Right. What you find in France is that, you know, we have a case in France where every girl is examined. Every child is examined up to the age of eight. So if the doctor examines you and they find that you've had your genitals cut or damaged in any way, you automatically report it to the police. So it's not an issue of you, the child, having to go okay. and then report or even speak. You're not in, in, in that in position. Yeah, You're yeah. not put in that position. I we don't know if I'm case. comfortable with every child being examined yeah. either. That's, that's, that's a different, issue that's a, you know, France does things yeah. differently. I mean, I'm However, in the UK, I mean, we've had cases where there's, there was a case, a test case in Camden, mm -hmm. where a young Somali girl, she was 13, had been taken home for FGM. When it came to the prosecution reporting, this girl was actually being protected, but she managed to get to, her, you know, family and people were influencing her. She kept changing her story, etc. So they said her story was actually not valid. Mm. And she kept changing. So, but they shouldn't have put that child through yeah. that. I mean, it's very similar. Again, yeah. the, I mean, this is in our legal system, especially violence, domestic violence, rape, Absolutely. things like yes. this. Yes. That yes. We have a long way to go in we terms do. of protecting yep. the victim. The victim. Or yeah. the woman. So called victim. So called victim. <laughs> because but, because but for, for that mm. to happen, the woman needs to be empowered enough. Because yeah. I always say, you know, the word no is very simple, but. You need, you need work has to take place. But you're never going so to get a trial no. to no, to, see, to take their me, their so parents. For example, mm -hmm. when I, I I grew up in Europe all my life and I thought FGM was fine. Really, it didn't affect me. I had a daughter. If I didn't have the prevention work and the education, mm. who knows? I can't promise you right now mm. that my daughter couldn't have been cut because for me, having that prevention work, mm -hmm. it's very important. The mother being told this affects you. Do you challenging that parent. So unless I was, if I wasn't empowered enough to say no, mm. then really. How does your mother feel now? Oh, mom, actually, strangely, we had a really long discussion the other day about, obviously, this subject. And she said, because the problem that happened with the Somali community, the majority of Somalis are Muslim, so they were told it was part of their religion. And she, she read the Quran herself. She actually runs a mosque in her house now. Mm. That's a mosque. Discussion. Yeah, she runs, yeah, she runs it in her house. For women, and for just women, for women only women. run, mm. and, and the woman, who the person who teaches them is a woman. Okay. Mm. So it's empowering in a way. They actually realize so many things that they were told was never in the Quran. Yeah. So we need to look at this as a patriarchal system, and mm -hmm. who runs the patriarchal system? The men. Mm -hmm. So for her, she, she actually said to me, her biggest regret has been if she knew what she knows now, there was no way in hell she would have let anyone touch her daughters. Mm. Wow. That's really how, and that's what it goes back to again, educating especially the mothers, is very, very important. Mm. But we do need to have a legal system because you wouldn't have that same conversation with the rapist or someone who sexually mm. abused mm -hmm. a child. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to have a law that really takes this very seriously where people mm. are prosecuted. But at the same time, because of this particular subject being, it's good for you, that's the way it's been delivered yeah. to you, yeah. mm -hmm. there has to be that prevention work in place. You I, see, I'm for me, the prevention work, for example, if a teacher, Sometimes, you know, girls, children will say things in, you know, mm -hmm. excited, I went on holiday and I had this mm -hmm. done, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of teachers don't pick it up. Mm -hmm. If a child tells you, clearly you as a teacher, you need to pick that up. Mm -hmm. But if you, the teacher, you're not aware, you don't really understand because what it is. Because to be honest, it's too horrific, you I would imagine, that teachers you know, wouldn't expect, so but, unless they but, are educated. But I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If a teacher sees a bruise on you, straight away she will report. Absolutely. Absolutely. If a teacher Thank sees you. a bruise on you, straight away she'll report. Mm. They'll come knocking on your door, telling you that this is what's happening. Your child has said blah, 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 blah. So we but that know is what, that. Um, Shayla had said yeah. earlier as well, that you cannot see the physical harm that's No, but that's if been somebody done. has told yes, you, mm. yeah. if a girl has been brave enough, or maybe she's been excited enough to tell you that. I remember in, in, it's in another occasion what would we're she talking. say? Would a girl, would a young girl say, I've been cut? She wouldn't use, she probably wouldn't use those terms. This, but yeah. there were particular there cases where mm -hmm. girls have gone up to their teachers yeah. and said something really bad happened to me yeah. and it's this and the teacher's response was but it's your culture isn't it yeah yeah the, no wow. there was one girl that's just shocking yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 
that's shocking. Mm. I mean, because I know that there's a there's a um, a new campaign at the moment by the NS. PCC, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the helpline, but also they, I saw the advert on the TV the other day, encouraging people to talk to their children about their private parts, mm -hmm. the parts that nobody else can see, so that mm -hmm. if anything happens, you can say that's part, you know, that somebody touched my private mm -hmm. parts. But the thing but is I that in a lot of cases, yeah. your mother who is taking you, it's yeah. really, the very yeah. person that you trust is the one who is taking you away. Yeah. And we also have to realise, when we're talking about this subject, we should realise it's not just a Somali issue. No, it is no. such a huge issue. Well, there's, anyway, there's at least 28, 28 countries 28 out of 40 no, in Africa, in Africa, Africa alone. Yeah. alone. And now they say it's in Yemen. How did you escape not having it done to you when you, brought, you were born up? Because I was brought, brought up in, northern, in, in southern Ghana. Yeah. However, I worked in northern Ghana and I had a lot of friends in northern Ghana. They went through it. I didn't even know. Right. Because in southern Ghana we don't. Yes. Again. Yeah. In we southern Ghana we do not practice FGM at all. Yeah. You know, Our it's not something that we know. Ghana. Right. But those in northern Ghana, as we speak, some places in northern Ghana, it could be as high as sixty percent. Right. Although nationally in Ghana, the percentage now is about three percent. So it's reduced dramatically mm, in the so last twenty reduction. years. In the last twenty years, it used to be thirty percent in Ghana. Yeah. There's been a lot of work around and what, the law, and it's around the law There's and around the, law. the community. But you see, again, I always action. say that depending on the time at which FGM is done, in most places in West Africa particularly in Ghana, it used to be done at 12, 13, 14. So you as a child, you actually have the choice yes. to do it. Right. Whereas for a lot of, particularly in Somalia and young and in Sudan Gambia, as well, Gambia, they you know, babies. they do it to babies. They yeah. do it at a much younger age. Yeah. So between five, sometimes if you fall between five and 11 or 12. So between five and eight, girls would already have been through it. Yeah. So the mother is making the choice for you. Right. But when younger girls are, and they're going to school, secondary school, you have the chance to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And the mother, I, I mean, uh, a when difference. I read some of the mm. stories, the mother's normally not in the room. Yeah. Oh, no. not in all so cases. No. why is the mother not in the room? Not there in must, all cases. There must be. No, I mean, some uh, from my, uh, if I you know, talk about my own family, my own experience, mothers are not there. And I remember me me asking my mother this question. I've got a daughter myself. I can't watch my daughter have what an injection. Made you, what done. made you decide that your daughter would not have an FGM done to her? Because someone challenged me. At what challenged age? Me, uh, I, was, I just had it at the time. So I was 21, 22. And who challenged you? Uh, it was a health, uh, somebody who worked in a specialist clinic who I went to see previously. But I actually went and uh, got a job there as an interpreter, funnily mm. enough, at the same clinic. And the person who managed this clinic, and she, it was the way she, she wasn't being uh, rude about it. She just asked my opinions, and she just kept saying, what do you think about it? And I, my response was, oh, it's fine, you know, I'm okay. You know, very blase kind of responses mm. the whole time. And, but because I, I read it, and I kept reading, I got really curious about the whole subject. But it's seen the images. She invited me to a presentation that she did. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember she put me aside before the presentation. She said to me, Oh, Leila, you know, I don't want you to, if you get upset, I'll understand, you know, we, we're here to support you. And I remember thinking, you I've don't need any help support. Yeah. Why are you telling me about yeah. this? Mm -hmm. And I remember the second slide went up and I broke down. And oh. I was like, oh my God, what happened? And I was, I, I was upset that I got upset. Mm. <laughs> I was like, why am I getting upset? Why am I yeah. getting upset? It was yeah. really yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember she said to me, mm. she was a counsellor, she said to me, have you felt like this before? And I yeah. said, yes. Mm -hmm. I said, every time I have an examination at the yeah. hospital, okay. especially during the pregnancy, mm. I'm, I used to black out. Right. But no one ever questioned why someone blacks out when they've been examined. When you say black out, you meant you literally fainted? I faint. I literally wow. faint. Mm. So nobody questioned. And that's why, I, that's why I said, there's no point of having these very important documents when it's not implemented yes. properly. Yes. Right. I mean, I'm a mm, counsellor. Yeah. I would, if someone's blacking out, I would think, wait a minute, Let me something ask. happened. Yeah. Every time you you're think, being examined. Yeah, mm. you would think. And you would note it. Yeah. And then have some discussions about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. So having mm -hmm. that journey mm -hmm. where someone challenged me, mm -hmm. asked me that question, came mm -hmm. back to me, yeah. gave me the facts, mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute. And I, seeing how I reacted, mm -hmm. So I, in our family, we had a big discussion, and that's where we said, there's no way in hell this is going to happen. Right. To my You're just saying that's about amazing. the reproductive that's health amazing. aspect. Uh, it was very interesting. You know, we forward that's did amazing. some research with the community, and there were very interesting experiences of the. Uh, I want to come. Yeah. I want to come back to that. I want to come back on the right. I want to talk about the work that you do in forward and the work that you do in mm -hmm. Daughters of Eve and that prevention work mm -hmm. and the work to highlight what happens, why it happens. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about. We're going to come back and talk about that after the break. Thank you very much.
Today we've been discussing um, FGM and what we're going to talk about now in the final segment of this really important subject is prevention and education. What do we do? How do we do it? How do we get the message out there? Um, so, Auntie Nana, yes. tell me, what, what does Forward do? Um, Forward's work is working at different levels. We work with policy makers, we work with statutory agencies, but we do work with communities and young people. And I think the work that we really see making a big difference is the community level work. Mm. We conducted research. It was very interesting because we, normal research, you find that you bring university graduates, researchers mm. who come to do this. But we train the women. And very in, academic. Empirical yeah. evidence. Yes, da, da, da. statistical. Yeah. But we actually trained women themselves right. to do the research, Nothing. participatory research. It was fascinating. We yeah. got a lot of stories. We got a lot of anecdotes. In fact, one of the captions of the it was like FGM is always with us because right. the woman actually mm. mentioned that it is always with us yeah. you know and we need to look at it they gave stories of how they had very bad uh, experiences with the health uh, services a woman mentioned that she delivered in one hospital and the doctor looked at her and he said did you have an accident down there wow. now this woman was pregnant at the time of delivery and then she said no and then I had FGM then she had to tell the doctor what is FGM the woman started talking to the doctor. The doctor also started crying. Wow. And then the woman who was in labor had to console the doctor <laughs> and tell the doctor that, you know, yeah. it's okay. It's, you know. So there is, you know, these stories help yeah. people to realize that the health system is not really geared to supporting them. The health system, but the education, education system. system. Yes, but yeah. now there's been some training. But it's, re it's very interesting. There's even been studies by the uh, midwifery, uh, Royal College of Midwives. They said a number of the, the, the midwives said, they didn't know what to do when yeah. they met women. About They couldn't even tell the full types of uh, female genital can mutilation. I, but I can imagine, though, the shock yes. of the first time you see a woman who's yeah. been FGM, who's pregnant, and, if you and, don't know know, and you don't yeah. know, you've never oh, seen what to, what to yeah. do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. And um, is it reversible? Uh, they talk about this, reverse, <laughs> this reversal of <laughs> FGM, which... Yeah. Presumably, well, you want to have done before yeah. your, you, get, you give birth. Definitely. I mean, um, my main role with Daughters of Eve is to do the pre counseling before. They use the word reversal, but actually, it's not reversal because it's been cut off. Mm -hmm. So oh. we just call it reopening of the wound, yep. basically. Okay. And mm. that helps the woman you know, urinate because I think a lot of people don't know if you've gone through FGM type 3, it takes you 20 minutes or 30 minutes to urinate at times. Something that somebody would yeah. do in seconds. Yeah. Wow. And a lot of girls, in, and our, our main work, it's really work with young women. It takes 20 to 30 minutes, to, 30 minutes to, urinate. to urinate. And that's why I suppose the teachers well, this could is pick yeah. up the, the fact yeah. if yeah, a I, young child yeah. takes that long to urinate. In the bathroom. In, fact, in the I bathroom. give you an example, actually, okay. with the work that we did with a couple of the schools who allowed us in was when we mentioned that especially PE teachers are very mm. key mm. and the person who does the attendance. Because mm. when these girls have their menstrual week, they don't come to school. Yeah. They're really sick, they're really ill because the blood is sitting there yeah. and it obviously affects them. They can't concentrate. And I remember in school, if you were in your period, your PE teacher would say, you need to do more exercise. I always say, it's the worst nightmare. It's the, that girl's worst nightmare if you mm. ask her to do that. So that with our work it's important that we are in schools mainly so we can give them those facts so they can pick up i remember one this particular school they actually had to bring three girls back to school again because they thought these girls were bunking off classes every time they went to the toilet they took 30 minutes yeah of course mm -hmm. you remember one particular mm -hmm. girl mm -hmm. and i remember saying to this girl why didn't you say anything like any other te teenager she said oh, i didn't want them thinking i was a freak mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it yeah. shouldn't be up to that child the t these are professionals who are there. Our children are with these professionals eight hours of the day. Yeah. So they have to pick up things that maybe I won't able to pick up because I don't spend eight hours with my daughter. Would they mm. feel, would the child feel a betrayal to the family and to the parents if it gets picked up? I mean, definitely there will be them some level of, depending on the, how the family treats that child. And so again, you'd find that there isn't a lot of focus on that child. Mm. And so if there is the onus on that child to be able to pick up the issue, then there needs to be support for the child. Mm. And what we actually realize is that the professionals have to be able to understand how to deal with these issues. But because there is so much push for prosecution, sometimes the child doesn't really matter. And this is what we want to 
let everybody know that every child matters, mm. whether she's Absolutely. black, blue, or grey. When I was in government, we had a we had a program that said just that every child matters. Yes. There was a whole docu yep. policy documentation yes. Yes. around yes. every Definitely. child matters. My question yes. is always yeah. are we with FGM? We are picking and choosing. It yes. doesn't matter, we are yeah. you're yeah. like, you don't matter, but you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we really yeah. need to be honest about yeah. that. And conviction is part of solving this problem. Yeah. But how are you going to get a conviction if that girl isn't empowered enough to even say she's gone through yeah. it? That's my problem. Mm. So I think it's it's empowerment we is yeah. the absolute yeah. key. I think it's necessary. In fact, when and we... The, and the, sorry, the empowerment and the integration of any government initiative like this, for instance, yes in law, in legislation, Definitely. in child Definitely. protection Definitely. programs, Definitely. and through yes. schools. Yes. And through PSHE, which, mm -hmm. which yeah. was something that I campaigned for again, yes. Yes. whilst in government, to try and get P PSHE yeah. compulsory, compulsory in schools so yeah. that you can have some education. Yeah. Although, parents can still opt their child out of, of course. it. Of course. Of so course. that is another But, but this is where you need to, I mean, like we, here, mm. it's like, uh, our annual report, we say raising voices of change. Yeah. There is change happening in the UK. We know women are changing. And it's about us to raise voices of those who are changing. We've yeah. created an opportunity for women. We have a women's health and leadership training where women go through leadership training around who am I, why do I do these issues? What are my values? Looking at what is FGM, issues around sexual. We have a very interesting model called sec, uh, Speak Easy. It's about speaking easy around sexual matters, looking at safeguarding for women, because a lot of these women, nobody is telling them about safeguarding. I had a very good experience of my neighbor whose flat was burning. When we came to help her, the first thing she said is that the social service is going to come for my children. Now, for a lot of community women, social services is just the yeah, taboo subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you enable yeah. communities, yeah. women, to understand that, you know, social services are there to help you. Yeah. Social services are there to protect you. Yeah. And we need to create that environment. But if we haven't spoken, a woman who has taken the plane and come here and she's been housed in, you know, a, a refugee place or being resettled somewhere, who's going to tell her all these issues yeah. without somebody creating that environment for her to be enabled? Yeah. We are forward think that this is very, very strategic. Yeah. You need to empower women make them leaders, make them have a voice, and make them assertive enough to say that, you know what, my daughter is not going to go through it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and just yeah. kind of echo what Nana is saying, with Daughters of Eve, our aim was always to give women that safe space where they can actually call FGM for what it is. Because a lot of people are scared of using the word child abuse, it's violence. Because it's something that your parents have done to you. So that's really, really key. Until those women are empowered, it's very, very difficult to get any convictions. However, the government also needs to take responsibility for that because they need to have this work implemented. Right now, Daughters of we have uh, put up an e-petition, mm -hmm. you know, saying to the government, you need to take this very seriously. Actually, you are committing a crime mm -hmm. by, not by not protecting these girls because your, your assumption is it's a cultural practice, we don't need to get in there. So mm -hmm. actually, you are committing a crime against this child by not making sure they have the right oh, Yeah, protection. absolutely. I mean, in, U in the UK, it's mm -hmm. absolutely a crime. You know, there's so many different laws mm -hmm. and legislation that it can be brought uh, under, you know, child abuse, yeah, you need to put the work in violence. But mm -hmm. yeah, and mm -hmm. what's your, what's the, is the e-petition on it's the number e 10 website? Uh, yep, if you go uh, uh, either on our Daughters of Eve Facebook page, Twitter page, my page, you'll find it on there. And if you go, uh, at the moment I'm filming a uh, documentary with Channel 4, so if you go on Channel 4's website also, you'll find that the petition is there. Okay. So mm -hmm. please, your signatures are very, very important because this has to stop. And it's happening here in the UK without us going somewhere else. Yeah, it has to I, stop. I, I think Auntie for Nana, me, it has to stop. It has to stop, but I always say that Stopping FGM, we should realize that this is a global package. It's a global problem. It happens in Africa. It happens in the UK. It happens in Europe. We need to work together. You know, we cannot talk about FGM as single issues. It's all part of the issue of well-being, the issue of rights. The issue is a holistic approach. And you find that in communities where FGM is practiced, they also practice child marriage. There's Absolutely. high levels of domestic violence. So mm -hmm. we need to see this as a package yeah. and really work as a package towards on the abuse and abuse violence, and violence and rights of women and girls. And, girls. and to end on a positive note, um, the, the s solution, if you like, part of the solution of this is, as you say, to empower women 
I say there is a growing movement, you say, where women Definitely. have become empowered, where they are working yes, to yes, change it, where they're yes, also yes. educating men, even if it's dragging them yep. to the oh, birthing yes, pool, yes, yes, or to the, yes, on the, yes, on the yes, bed, on the labor bed, we, and having I, to I, see what we, the women We had women in Bristol, Forward Women's Programme, they actually went, campaigned, and marched in the streets of Bristol saying no to female genital mutilation. I mean, that was amazing. And yeah. that has actually snowballed. Yeah. And now we're getting men coming on board. So we do need these kinds of movements. We do need to give women support, give them the voice to actually raise and make change happen. Absolutely. Because I can transform your life, you can. Absolutely. And it's for you as a woman to understand that you can make a choice. And the choice in making it is to protect your daughter. Not for yourself, but for her child, her good, and for the good of all society. That's what we want. Absolutely. And Leila? And I'll, I'll just add about, I think men are part of the problem, so they have to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. They are parents, they are brothers, they are husbands. So for me to say, oh, it's a women's issue, actually, it's done for you. So you are part of the solution and you need to be part of these campaigns. And the UK government really needs to make this a frontline agenda. Because to me, I always feel anything to do with women and children is always put in the back burner somewhere. And if, you know, the most affected group is black children. Mm. So also that's, yeah. I'm not going to get into and more, more time and <laughs> now more than any more, no, more, more than any other time. Well, yes. we'll have you back on mm -hmm. uh, you. and we'll talk about some of the other issues, important issues that you, that you raise. Definitely. And, we're talking ab and we'll, we'll talk about that because at the end of the day, it is about taking women and yeah. their rights and their protection seriously. Yes. So yes. I want to thank... Uh, Layla and Antonana, I want to thank you both for coming thank on you. Live thank with Dawn Butler. It's a thank pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, the audience, for listening. Thank you. Tune in next week for another important debate right here in your living room. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.